It is a pleasure to meet again by the sea and to talk about maritime topics. We're kicking off the new season of Nautica, where we'll be talking about sailors, the sea, ports, faraway lands and more. I look forward to broadening my horizons with you. Enjoy your viewing. The sea is as beautiful and wide as a love, but as dangerous and cunning as a beast of the forest. At first it rustles, soothes, invites, then pulls you into open sea and raises steep crests of waves, launches gusts of wind and makes swirls to the sky. It seizes the boat and smashes it against its hard backs of waves. They break the vessel's ribs, and the deck ear toppled over with masses of water like a flood of sin. They grab you by the leg or hair and pull you down, then kick you to the bottom of the sea on the rocks until they squeeze the last of your breath out of you, and fill your lungs with white, white coral sand. From that moment on, you belong to the mother of the sea, and only she has the right to decide whether to give your body to be buried in the grave or to keep it forever in its depths. This is how a medieval sailor describes the sea in his diary. Yet, despite these extreme dangers, the sea has always been an enticing route for people to reach distant lands and find a new place to live. 6,000 years have passed since the most primitive floating craft first appeared on the banks of the Nile. First they rode along the coast in rowing boats. And it took centuries before they ventured out to sea. But when an unknown sailor in Egypt first hoisted a square sail, progress was unstoppable. The sea was crisscrossed by Greeks and Phoenicians, Romans and Arabs. They traded and fought. They explored the coast and fished. Ancient coastal peoples built ever larger boats, even with several rows, which now crossed the Mediterranean in any direction without problems. It was another millennium later that the first grasp of navigation was born. Navigating by the stars and understanding the prevailing wind directions enabled us to return from our sea voyage to its starting point. New navigational aids such as charts appeared and the first forerunners of the compass were introduced from the east, allowing the first ships to go out into the ocean and grope their way north along the coast. The peoples living along the high seas of Europe had also developed their shipbuilding skills. With their clinker-built sailing ships, symmetrical at both ends and unrivaled in maneuverability. They had reached all the islands around Europe and their experience as sailors centuries later, the first were allowed to be the first to cross the ocean. The word ship actually comes from the old High German language, the so-called cog. If we are talking about the territory of Latvia, the first evidence is also from the so-called Viking Age. 8 to 10. Century. But it was in the territory of Riga in 1938 to 1939 that the so-called ancient ship of Riga was discovered. The 14 meter long, four and a half meter wide ancient ship of Riga was found in the water area of the then Ridzin or Riga harbor. A total of two such ships were discovered during archaeological excavations, but unfortunately, with the outbreak of World War II, these ship parts were dismantled and placed in a special warehouse near St. Peter's Church and this ancient Riga ship perished in a fire. It was most likely the Viking ship of Northern Europe's most active and intimidating sea voyagers of the time. However, it would be a mistake to see the Vikings as just marauders from the sea. They were also promoters of trade and discoverers of new sea routes and lands. The Vikings came here by the mighty road from west to east, the Dogava. Then the ships were towed to the Dnieper, and then they made it as far as the Black Sea and Constantinople. The ship shape has evolved from a cane sticks tied in a bun and monocoque to nuclear submarines and half kilometer long cruise ships. But in general, paddles and sails dominated for thousands of years. Larger and more voluminous hulls were built. The variety of rigging and the number of sails arranged in the masts was beyond any imagination. Deck guns both protected precious cargo and attacked coastal fortresses. Ships crossed the ocean safely, made great geographical discoveries and sailed around the world. The fleet was divided into a war fleet and a merchant fleet. And this process took place from 8 to 10. Century until 17. 
century. So it is the time of the sailing ship Blossom. Due to its extremely favorable geographical position, the territory of present-day Latvia was involved in all phases of maritime development. The Baltic Sea was not the scene of any major naval battles. However, national trade, shipping and freight developed rapidly. Over the centuries, Riga became the most important port in the southeastern region. The port of Riga was originally located right at the mouth of the river Ridzine. This river got clogged and in fact already 17th century ships could no longer dock there and the port of Riga slowly moved directly to the city walls. The question is, what exactly were they carrying? Simply put, they mostly were agricultural goods that shipped to Western Europe, but herring, coal and wine also came here from Western Europe. So the cargo of so-called colonial goods was measured in so-called Danzig last. One last is 2,000 kilograms, so two tons. The largest the ship were able to take on board about a dozen lasts, or about 40 tons. However, the most sought-after commodity in the port of Riga were mass trees, which at that time were unquestionably considered the best in the world. Because of its surprising length and straightness, in the 16th century the sails of most Western European ships were hoisted from the masts of Riga Pine. The income from the mast trade was substantial. Soon Riga could afford to build its own ships. We see the first flag of Riga, a black background with a white cross. Century, when the present flag of Riga, white and blue with the coat of arms, gradually began to be used on ships. Undoubtedly the most powerful and wealthy 17th. The shipowner of the century was Duke Jacob Kettler of Courland and Semigalia, who lived well ahead of his time with his innovative thinking and ambition. Duke Jacob pursued a policy of mercantilism, exporting as much as possible and importing as little as possible. In other words, active trade. He had six shipyards in total. The largest was in Vanspils, where 120 ships were built. Coastal or so-called cabotage ships were built in Kuldik. When the so-called ship christening took place, Duke Jacob himself was present. And when the bow of the ship touched the water, the ship was given a name. To a modern person, these names seem very strange. Duke Jacob had a ship, called Destruction, Flowerpot, Crocodile. Well, in this spirit. He then appointed the captain of the ship. The captains were Dutch and the Latvians were the ship's deck hands. The ships were highly decorated. Because at that time there was such a belief that ships should be decorated with a beast's head covered arm. For example, this bow, which washed up in Sonega in the 1930s. Animals were also sacrificed and the deck of the ship was sprinkled with blood before the maiden voyage. Those were the Middle Ages, and those were the customs here. Navigational instruments played a huge role in determining the course of ships. As they became more sophisticated, it became possible to sail in weather conditions where the sun and stars were not visible. The sailors' great fear of disorientation and getting lost in the ocean disappeared. Navigation instruments appear, sextant, octant. The compass, in its essence, comes from China by year 1300. By that year, Europe was actually familiar with the compass. However, navigational instruments do not drive the ship. And to use them properly requires knowledge that was originally only available to the ship's officers and was carefully concealed from the rest of the crew to prevent mutinies and takeovers. However, the time came when it was no longer possible to do without general maritime education. And the first maritime school had two classes right here on Pelasta Street, in two small rooms from year 1789. The Riga City Council collected a ship's tax when a foreign ship entered the port of Riga and on the basis of this tax it also maintained these two classrooms, where both maritime astronomy and mathematics were taught. There were virtually no teaching aids. There were no textbooks, 
and knowledge was passed on to students orally. This Tay class operated periodically, at times, interrupting their activities. But in 1839, in the year German Captain Foss set up a maritime school in Riga, where they trained seamen in German and enrolled sailors in this school who already had about five years of experience at sea. So gentlemen with experience. Although the development of ships has been going on for thousands of years, the real progress in shipbuilding started only two centuries ago. It marked the end of a huge era of rowing and sailing ships. The invention of the steam engine and its adaptation to steer ships in the right direction was an engineering revolution and a major innovation. However, things did not go as smoothly as one might think. The first fully operational steamers did not appear until the very beginning of the 19th century, however. Riga had to wait almost 30 years before one of them appeared in the Dogava. At first they were paddlewheel steamers and the first to enter the port of Riga from Lübeck was on June 8, 1839. 8th June. First steamer. Although the steam engine was turning propellers faster and faster, wind-powered sailing ships were not yet abandoned in the territory of modern Latvia. And there was another, non-maritime reason. It is a socio-economic process, the abolition of serfdom in Russia. And with it, a person living on the coast becomes a person who, by joining forces, can also build his own sailing ships. For the coastal sailing boat trade. The first sailing vessel was built in the year 1857. And then more and more were built and by the First World War 550 sailing ships had been built. There are three stages. The first stage is the preparation of timber in the forests, which is then processed into boards. It was very important that this had to be done in the winter months until about the end of February. Why? Because later the circulation of juices already started and then the boards are no longer useful. A special plank floor has been created. This is a model of the Furless shipyard. And this is where the hull of a sailing ship is being built. There was also a boarding shop so that the bow and stern boards could be bent. The process was not so fast either. The largest sailing ships took four to five years to build, while the conventional ones took about three years. Sailing vessels had a rather short lifespan, on average about five to ten years. As navigational instruments had also already developed, more and more went directly to the open sea, where the dangers were far greater. The first word spoken when the bow touched the water was the name of the ship. And a curious incident happened when horses were harnessed in front of the ship, and they were going too fast. And what does the butler say? He says Prue. And so one sailing ship was named Prue. The ship is pushed into the sea through a waxed gutter. This process took quite a long time. It could have lasted even had two weeks, because it was centimeter by centimeter. The four-masted Barkentina Andres Vide is the largest vessel built in Inagi and it lasted for more than 10 years. It was stranded off Cape Verde, it ended its life there too. One of the most famous shipbuilders was Morgan Stern, who was involved in the construction of 40 sailing ships. Where were the shipbuilding districts? So. If we start from Inagi, Inagi, leap up, Riga surroundings. Because you see what it's all about. Once the hull is in the water, it is towed to a pier in Riga. Sailing ships built off the Latvian coast, called firewood johnnies, quickly spread all over the world and could even be found in ports overseas. The ships themselves carried an unimaginable amount of cargo, which laid the foundation for Latvian shipping companies and their fame. Latvian sailors gained a very high reputation in the world as reliable and very knowledgeable mates, helmsmen and captains. After the abolition of serfdom, shipbuilding required a maritime education for those who sailed on these ships. And in 1867, by order of the Tsar, democratic maritime schools were established, 
where education was conducted in the local language, Latvian. Maritime schools was divided into three levels. First level schools trained cabotage helmsmen and captains. Second level schools gave the right to sail on the Baltic Sea. And the third level was, at the highest, it prepared the captains of the high seas. Einigi Sea School was a third level school. There were 40 maritime schools in Tsarist Russia, 11 of which were in Latvia. But unfortunately this process, this democratic process ended. Einigi Maritime School was taught in Latvian, but in 1904. In the following year, they switched to Russian. So, who says that the teaching there was not in Latvian? The peculiarity of all these 11 maritime schools is that they existed until the First World War and were then evacuated to the southern regions of Russia and also to Ukraine. And then, after the First World War ended, there was a different education system, and these maritime schools, except for Vanspios and Liapaya, ceased to exist for a short while. The legendary Inazi Maritime School is one of Latvia's national prides. This will also be the subject of the next story.